when we begin to discuss the our association with nature perhaps we begin by conceding that man is forever in love with nature leave aside natural disasters and nature is unfailingly beautiful rare is one who has not been touched by the beauty of this nature but other than this romantic disposition perhaps there is a more potent philosophical basis for the idea of man in nature and consequently to the ideas of place making we use the term mother nature or we refer to nature as her but perhaps we can also think of nature as looking back at us and the places we make and then immediately the questions of memory and consciousness of a place come to prominence these are some realizations which have informed my work and before i take you to bengal where most of my work is i would like to share with you some thoughts and inspirations which have influenced my work impressions that feeling of being in the delta hot humid breezy mosquitoes patches of green in a sea of greens look up and see an ocean in clouds gray white or the colors of the sun sun that beautiful light i remember from my childhood slashes of afternoon on the golden of the straw i remember the smell i remember the sounds of the straw when i said i loved the rain the sun and everything in between i meant i wanted to build to enjoy the rain the sun and everything in between and where else but here the home of the brahmaputra and the jamuna wedded together in the softest soil moist as the womb of the mother before the shadow of the rock the himalayas the largest delta in the world touches the waters of the bay this is bengal a geocultural region woven out of an intricate network of rivers and canals and to which all art forms respond from the emotionally rendered bhawaiya songs and the colors of the stitches of nokshi katha textiles to the living and lost architecture of the delta much of my childhood was spent by the side of the river padma which draws its waters from the mighty ganges it is difficult to bring to words my memories of those waters of the clouds both above and soaked in reflection and the finest and softest of all soils the alluvial layers where the ground was still moist from receding waters but it is not merely the impact of those elements for me a river is not the same again or the darkness before a storm in monsoon i have been forever changed by the spirituality of that land the tropical light introduces us to the landscape of bengal the strong sun's light reveals the beauty of its nature it falls on mountains 
fields of paddy and trees, but the rest is spilt light, lost light. It is the architect who by the design of his apertures brings in the spilt light into the deep insides of its architecture. He gives it shape, lets it play, or prevents it from removing his shadows. For with the darkness of shadows comes the appreciation of light, of the color of light, of the depth of light. Have you seen the depth of Khan's light? At the National Assembly building in Dhaka, Khan brings in a silvery light, playful as the water from which the building rises. Nowhere has a space been more gracefully lit than by the magical light of his tropical sun. I am in search of shadows. Shadows under a banyan tree, behind a column, or from a dark cloud. Have you ever been in a forest, a temple, or in a village courtyard? Shadows have a wonderful way of celebrating the presence of light. They seem to say, we do not hide our purpose is to reveal. Too many times we have seen buildings naked, sunburnt, clad only in a curtain of glass. What is the purpose, I say? Let us not chase the shadows away. Then we are left with a pale, dead light, uninspiring, unnecessary. I return to the comfort of the shadow which the light has brought in. Materials, ask me not of materials. I'm still listening to the story of the clay earth millions of years before you have uncovered it, molded it, burnt it for bricks or terracotta temples. I wish to know more and I want to learn to care like gold in the hands of a goldsmith. And oh, the textures, the imperfections, the feeling, the beckoning. The building doesn't need ornament. The material is the ornament. There was a time when I thought I couldn't live in the city. It was too powerful. Too much happening in too little time. Then I realized it was possible to create your own secret space in a city. It would be free from the rush elsewhere. It would have its own pace, its own time. Time. Is it true that if the sun hadn't moved, there wouldn't have been time? Or is it locked in a Swiss watch or in a Japanese pendulum? I like to leave time out of my buildings. I sense that leaves out a lot of other things, styles, trends, isms, and so on. I'm tired of efficient buildings. Buildings that offer you not a moment to pause, to ponder, to wish, to recollect. Buildings that work well, better than you'd wish for, and give you nothing else. In an office or railway station, yes. But in a home or in front of art, in an art gallery, I look for a loss of time, absence of time. And then there arises the opportunity for serenity to invade and silence, the silence of a breeze, the silence of a deep sleep, 
the silence of a space. My work used to confuse me, but it was important to be confused. I sense in confusion lies the seeds of discovery of truth. I drink a drink from the broth of seven or ten thousand years, thousand years of my history, and I feel alive again. The myth, the mystery, the mysticism, the emotion, the philosophy, the chaos, the romance. Yes, I'm in love with the Bengali way of life. Come away with me for an hour of the Sarod and you will know what I mean. But ask me not of my work, for I create for the love of art. And ask me not of the present or the future, I know neither. Today I wish to show you some projects only in Bangladesh and these are the various areas that we are working in, some very remote, uh, with various geographical conditions closer to the bay, for example, or up north closer to the Himalayas, which is here. The first project is a number of projects that we did starting from 2005. It was to raise an entire settlement or village. This is the map of Bangladesh, which shows its 700 rivers and its various canals. As you can see, the question is really whether it is water in the land or land in the water. We are working in this area where the river Brahmaputra comes from Tibet, from the glaciers in Tibet, comes down like this in parts of India and then enters Bangladesh like this and then eventually flows into the Bay of Bengal. Now, this area here is one of the poorest part of the country. Um, the entire land of Bangladesh is very flat and so when the waters come in, they come in very slowly. They move very slowly and they move in a very horizontal fashion. And this is the landscape. In this wide river, sandbanks form and people live on those islands, river islands or sandbanks. The reason being, they're landless people. And every flooding season, water comes into their homes. So this is, for example, a sandbank forming in the river very slowly, and then it will become something like this. And on it will be houses and homes. So our project was basically to look at this river, which is about 10 kilometers wide, or more than 10 kilometers wide. But in the dry season, these islands form. And in the flooding, in the rainy season, all of it becomes one large river. But the people don't move away because if they go, it would be hard for them to come back because it is, it is by position, you know, by, there's no right of land. So our project was very simple, to try to understand how we could better this situation so they would be living here and the flood would be flowing about eight feet above where they were sort of living. But still, they would not leave their houses. They would be living on top of their houses or on the trees or something. And so the project through an NGO was um, to try to raise, instead of individual houses, to raise an entire settlement an entire village above that flood level. The problem is these rivers are quite ferocious in the sense during the rainy season. There's a lot of water flow 
and uh, this, it, it's, it's a quite a lot of speed with which the water comes. And how to sort of make something which will last and not break away very easily. So we, we looked at the patterns of the various sandbanks that form, and they form comet ships because when the water comes like this, and as they leave out, they leave a tail. So this was our, our sort of proposal for the island, a teardrop-shaped island from where the water will pass like this and leave. And in the middle of the island, there would be a pond which would hold fresh water. Now this is basically what we came out with. So we would dig here and this would be used to raise this part and also sort of form a kind of a sloping side and so the water would pass like this. Now it's very difficult to make a kind of a, a model of this, a hydraulic model of this. So it was based on local knowledge and quite a lot of our observations of those of the various visits that we did and this would uh, this is what a typical plinth would look like in the landscape in the dry season so it was a as you say a participatory uh, kind of project it was self built and it was also food for work, in a sense, the people whose homes would be mo moved up onto the raised area, they are the ones who worked on the plinth itself, and they were paid to do so. And it was a very basic way of doing it, as you can see. So that's one of our architects working there with the villagers, giving out layouts. And then this is the pond which is being dug which again helps to raise the, the, the main island, if you will, and then it starts to form. And green returns, and eventually life returns. A very simple solution for a very, very basic budget that we had. Now, for the placing of the houses themselves, we did not design the houses because the houses, existing houses, would be moved up onto this raised plinth. But we sort of mapped out how the, place, the houses could be placed. And this was based on the, the way, the pattern of the placing of houses in a village. As you can see, the, instead of a walkway, there are courtyards which connect to another courtyard and then walk into another courtyard, and that's what we did. And we allowed the villagers to not follow our drawing. But what was interesting, that most of the time they did follow the drawing and they said, yes, but we would like to move this house a little bit this way to um, sort of get a little bit more breeze, etc. So it was, again, quite an interactive process from which, of course, we learned quite a lot. And this is what it looks like um, in, in reality. So in the rainy season, you would see that all of it would be water, and this would be like an island. This is what it is, the life on the uh, settlement. Last year, there was a very bad flood. And this is how the rest of the places became. But our plant, our race settlements were dry, as you can see. And this is jute being. So life could continue, it, of course, with difficulty. But life could continue. And the cattle could be brought up onto this raised level and uh, be saved. And this is an actual photograph of that time. So all around, a fierce flood is flowing, but in the center you have clean water from the rain, which is harvested from the rain, and this, of course, is used for various um, purposes. This is a project from 1999-2000. This is a building I did for my um, mother's family 
uh, I designed and constructed it. The entire building is constructed by me in the sense I got very much involved in the construction to understand um, really how it is done in, in, in a country like Bangladesh. But on top of it, there's a little apartment which is like a pavilion. It's all open all around. It's a very small apartment. It's divided into four spaces. This is the courtyard, a sleeping area. This is a sitting area, and this is a dining area. And the courtyard is a tall kind of a volume. So the air from the surrounding area is drawn up like a chimney or stack effect. This is the courtyard. Now, this is a very personal project. This is where we live. And so uh, the detailing and the materials and the way this came about is, is, is a very personal t statement, if you will. But most of the material here are recycled. For example, the stone that you see comes from a project 10 years ago. These are all reject pieces. They were lying in a warehouse, and um, they were used um, in, in various ways. To the, to the roof of the courtyard. And then, of course, the, the living spaces can be darker, and the, the airflow actually. What is important in a country like Bangladesh, in, in the tropical kind of weather, is cross ventilation, not just ventilation, but cross ventilation, so that the air is allowed to move in and out. So that is how this works. In the monsoon, for example. Now, all the bricks that you see come from the old part of the city where they're breaking down old buildings. These are about 150-year-old bricks, um, and um, these were used in this project. So the, even the concrete was made from the, the wood salvaged from the, the, the box in which the elevator of the building came. And so the various channels take the rainwater away into uh, different areas and eventually out. So because these were reject pieces, there were various sizes. So for example, these are larger sizes, these are smaller sizes. So every day my work was to sort of set up these, and then the, the, the stone person would begin to lay them. The sleeping area. And of course, there's a lot of texture, because as I said, this is a personal space. So there's texture or, or uh, beneath the foot, so to speak. And then, of course, on the walls and in the ceiling. This is glass set into the concrete uh, before the casting. And the various materials come together, for example, wood, simple concrete, bricks, travertine, again concrete here. And it was also an idea to reverse, in the sense uh, stone flooring but on, on, the, on the dining table, it's ordinary, very ordinary concrete with uh, glass set in. Traditional copper worked in the kitchen. Traditional broken china pieces in the bath area. And all, of course, naturally ventilated and naturally lit. Everything in this house, including doorknobs, uh, hinges, everything is made, handmade. So various kinds of material, as I said, copper, handwork copper, um, teak. This, is, th this teak comes from uh, Chittagong, which is south of the country, and also from Burma. Concrete. So stone and the other materials. These are the shapes, sizes we got. These are the ways we could sort of set them. We also got very thin pieces. 
and this is what it is at night. Um, in 1997, um, we won a, a national competition to design the Museum of Independence, myself and my former partner, Marina Tabassum. Um, we worked on this project for, as you can see, um, quite a lot of, a big part of our life actually. Um, the reason being it's a government project and it went on and on and on. But, the, but the, the location of the project is a prominent, it w used to be a prominent race course. And then later during the Second World War it became, it was more uh, planted and you know there was um, uh, other structures which came up. And then one of the winning ideas was to there was a need for a museum and other ancillary facilities. The, one of the winning ideas was to have all the, the, the entire facilities below ground so that we could preserve the horizontal sort of green character of the park. And the roof of the museum then became a public plaza and which could also hold the story of the Liberation War. Now you might know that in 1971 Bangladesh became free from Pakistan uh, after a nine month long uh, guerrilla uh, kind of a warfare. Um, so people, ordinary people, farmers, people in the villages, in the cities, they fought against a fully um, sort of um, equipped army being present in the country. Um, and uh, it, it's a horrifying, uh, there are details on the internet also you can check. It was a very horrifying event. Uh, so to mark this, this project was initiated by the government. Um, the, the, on the plaza itself, the first point is where the, the father of the nation gave his famous, famous speech. And as you move towards the, the main monument, you encounter a very shallow pool of water with a hole in the center. It is like a black hole which draws in itself the, the, the water and this water falls into the the center of the museum below which is the heart of the museum so this represents the silent bearing of torture and rape and genocide by the people during those uh, horrifying nine months and the only other element is a long wall which sort of guides the visitor towards the monument itself and this wall holds the ramp which takes the visitors below ground. This is what it is in the city, as you can see, it's a very dense city and our idea of course was to preserve the openness as much as possible, so the only thing that is there is like a, is a large public plaza above ground. Again, the, the entire 67 acres of land, so all of it is green and just this part is, is, is the plaza area and beneath it the museum itself. The museum is again very simply lit. At the heart of it is a, is a kind of a rotunda space which has no display and in this falls the water from above. Now this is for the, I don't know if there, how many students there are, but I, I'm showing this slide to, to, to say well, this is my thesis project when in, in the final year, and that is what, what was built in the, in the museum. So as you can see, so this was, again, in the center, I was sort of working on this, this, this circle which brings the entire sort of kind of world together and an and open space where everybody could come. This is a cultural space. This is a cultural center. And here again, this becomes repeated. And what is to say for students is really whatever you do, whatever exercises you do in whichever year, it really stays with you. So I guess one needs to be quite careful and sort of invest a lot of time and energy into each and every of those projects that you do, even as a student, because uh, they're with you uh, for the rest of your life. This is the section, the, the museum and the tower itself and the wall that I talked about. And this is um, how it is set in the, the landscape. As you approach, this is the plaza that you see. And that's the shallow pool of water. The ramp going down. 
the museum below grade. Light coming from above. So all of it is concrete. This is the central rotunda, and this is a black exhibit area which shows, um, well, photo which it has photographs of genocide. And the government wanted to have these because these are part of the facts of, of, of that period. And as one is uh, sort of feeling emotional by seeing all those, one enters into this space, which is at the heart, as I said, of the museum. And the water falls from above, and the, uh, only, through the only oculus uh, in the ceiling through which the light comes. And in this space, uh, there are no displays. And in the sound of the water, one may remember those um, fallen, known, and unknown. One continues up through the various exhibition spaces. Here, the idea of monumentality was important. Now, for me, monumentality is not about how big it is. It is about presence. So it was important that we sort of look at this, the proportions and how it sort of is there. And, and that's how we sort of try to relate to, to the strength of the people through those, um, you know, through those struggles. The main monument itself is a tower of glass. We call it a, a tower of light. The glass is not set uh, like this, as you uh, ordinarily see. It is set like this, which means it is uh, the, the property of refraction is used as opposed to reflection. So it is stacked glass, um, 19 mil by 75, formed into prefab panels, which goes into this vertical space frame. And this, of course, harkens back to the thousands of years of our heritage of laying brick one above the other. And so the staggered glass has a certain materiality to it, a certain strength to it, and that is what we were interested in. It is low iron, low chromium clear glass, set very simply into the main structure. And it goes all the way to 46 meters or 150 feet. And during the day, in certain angles, you see the sun sort of moving through the tower itself. And at night, it becomes a beacon. These are photographs taken by me. There is no photoshopping. This is a, an, on a national day uh, from far away. This is a mosque, um, the first mosque. We have been doing quite a number of mosques. This is the first one we did. It's in the port city of Chittagong. Um, this is um, uh, sort of made by a, a local business person. Just go back one slide. Um, so so um, the mosque is in the port city of Chittagong. Um, the, the, the sponsor of mosques, they wanted to build it and give it to the community. Uh, for us, it was important to not look at the mosque as a, only as a religious space, but more as a spiritual space. And to sort of think if it could also become a kind of a place where the community can gather. So it essentially consists of two uh, simple volumes, two cuboid volumes, one the mosque proper and the, the other one as the, as the courtyard. 
So the courtyard is again given a form. So it, it is a kind of a reception kind of a volume for the main mosque itself. This is the uh, section to which I will come back later. So it is in the peri-urban area and it connects sort of both communities, the urban communities as well as uh, somewhat rural communities. And um, the front block, which is the courtyard, sort of links the, the nature, the horizontality with the, verti the, the vertical. And the horizontal sort of represents our life on Earth to, to nature, our connection to other, um, other people. And again, this as spiritual or connection to Zenith. So everywhere there is connection to nature, as I said, and views of it, views to the, to the community, to the surrounding areas. Now the client wanted a dome. They said we must have a dome. Now we realized why they, later on, after much struggles, we realized why they were asking for a dome. It was because the dome is an accentuating element. It sort of announces the presence of the mosque. But we don't need the mo dome as, as a structural element anymore. Historically, of course, as you know, the domes used to span spaces, but we don't need them anymore. So, so we cut up the dome to express the fact that this is a non-structural element, and then it brought in light, and it also took out light at night. During the day, and at night. So the, 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 the idea of this as an accentuating element is again um, more pronounced. We did another mosque in, again in Chittagong, in the port city of Chittagong, but here we found an old building, an old mosque about 200 years old. And although the owners were in two minds of keeping it because it, it was falling apart, we, we sort of restored it with the help of um, uh, uh, other experts. And this became the starting point, the generator of our design. So this is the old mosque, which is in the front on the roadside. And we designed the new mosque, and not a big one, at the back. Now the owners the, or the sponsors of this again wanted a large structure and we fought to say that it should really not be a big one. It should have some link in terms of proportion and in terms of visual connection to the old one. And so the past comes to the fore and the new goes to the back. A very simple volume with a main prayer space and veranda all around. Here, moving away from this idea of ornament, uh, the, the banishing of ornament in modernism, I knew it was important that in, uh, the, 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 the geometry in Islamic architecture was important. And this was brought in, but only in the ceiling. So you see it as you go in and you look up. Elsewhere, it is plain. And this is the roof structure which sort of generates that geometry. We borrowed an element from the old mosque, which is a kind of a grill. And this was turned into a cast iron grill, which wrapped the new structure. And so this is what it became. Now, again, these people, the, the, my clients, they wanted a dome. And again, this discussion started. So. Again, the idea of accentuating. The dome, which is a circular element, now became a cuboid element. Again, announcing that it is not an ordinary building, it is not a school 
or a house, but it allowed for air and light to come in as well. And of course, the various geometric patterns in the ceiling cast itself on the floor. This is what it is. It's, it's a simple concrete structure cast in wood. And the veranda is wrapped with this cast iron grill, which is the, the pattern of which is inspired from the old uh, building, from the, some of the geometric shapes in the old building. And it is hung. So it does not touch the ground. It is made light. This heavy sort of curtain is made light by not touching the ground. And it floats on water. The ceiling, as you go inside, and in the corners, the light comes in. And the, the casting of the concrete sort of corresponds to the, um, to the wood in the, in the doorway and other areas. And this is the veranda, which does not touch or does not come down to the ground. We were invited to um, make an installation in Venice two years ago. And um, the idea was to sort of talk about the struggles that we face as architects working um, in, in, a, in a complex um, climatic and economic area as in Bangladesh. So uh, this was the proposal which was sent to the curator Alejandro Aravena and these were the various sketches. It was in the Giardini in the, the central pavilion and in quite a prominent location just next to the entrance. The idea was a labyrinth to express that whatever we try to do, it is not easy to do. We go through various processes. And it is almost like going through a labyrinth. And then as we pass the labyrinth, we go into an inner space where the various projects are displayed. So here, four projects are displayed, three of which deal with climate change, our, the projects that we had done. One of the things that we did is to turn the idea of labyrinth, which is an architectural sort of um, element which has been going through history again and again. But we turned it uh, in a way because the labyrinth is made of glass, which means you see it, but you cannot go through. And as you move through the labyrinth itself, you encounter various terracotta plaques or tiles on which are etched um, drawings of old buildings, so, which sort of inspires us, which sort of guides us to, to our new sort of models and buildings that we do. And the, so again, this is, this is a kind of reversal of processes and uh, thousands of years old technology of making handmade tiles with a laser imprint on them. And as one goes inside, one goes into the kind of inner landscape. Now here, the various projects are displayed on these thin rods. Uh, these are like plants. The idea is to express that our projects take time to grow. We have calculated that it takes an average of seven years for us to complete a project in, uh, in our office. Uh, it takes a lot of patience. It's, it's definitely not advertisement. It's, it's much slower than that. Um, so it is like, like tending to a plan. So they grow slowly. And that was one of the ideas for the various projects to be displayed. And it was, of course, difficult for people to find their way through because it was difficult to understand whether there is a glass or not. But of course, that was intentional. 
The other reference, of course, to glass is Venice, where the, the Venini glass is famous. In 2007, a major cyclone struck Bangladesh uh, by the name of Siddur. Um, you might know that Bangladesh has a very complex weather system, um, probably the most complex weather system in the world. Uh, we have uh, major cyclones um, every few years. We have floods. We are in a major earthquake zone. Um, we have uh, quite a lot of heat, which sometimes causes drought. So uh, it's a very, very complex system. And the cyclones usually form here in the Bay of Bengal. Instead of moving towards Thailand, it moves up towards Bangladesh. And um, when it makes landfall, it causes huge destructions. And this is a satellite image of that cyclone of 2007. And this is what happened. Um, it, it caused, it, it took away lives of more than 10,000 people, innumerable animal lives, uh, damages of at least $1.7 billion. And as you can see, there were wind speeds of 260 kilometers per hour. I was in Dhaka. Um, on, that, on the night when this happened. The next morning, of course, one heard the reports and uh, some of my friends who are photographers and journalists were sending back what they were seeing and it was, of course, horror. And I decided that I didn't want to be in my studio comfortable like this, but to be there, to see, at least to be with them and to sort of see what was happening. So I myself and three of my colleagues, we went to um, that area. We took a boat. We were on the boat for five days. Um, and we traced the path of the cyclone as it made landfall. So the cyclone came in like this. So we took a boat from somewhere here. We came all the way down. We went to a place here. There's a little island here. And then we moved to all these areas. And of course, everywhere we went, we saw destruction. Myself, being a photographer, I took photographs. Um, uh, one of my colleagues made uh, sound recordings of whatever. We didn't ask any questions. People were, of course, traumatized. Uh, it's beyond belief what was happening there. So we never asked any questions. We never made any interviews. We just recorded what we heard uh, as people were talking. And. Um, so this is what it became. This is a river, if you believe it. Uh, you, you don't see it. You see a little bit of the land over there. And um, so try to imagine that the cyclone struck at midnight. It's all dark. The power had been cut for safety. Um, the wind speed is 260 kilometers per hour. Tidal surge has come in to seven meters high where you are standing. It's above seven meters. So it's like an inland sea. You don't see anything. You just hear the howling of the wind. And the, and the water is, of course, very, very choppy. And, and then when we were going around, people talked about demons in the sky. And this is something we could not understand. They always talked about demons. And, and then they said demons with fire. And we thought this is from trauma. They, they were not able to sort of express themselves or they saw something, they, they were hallucinating. But then later on, we understood that it was really fire in the sky. The speed of the wind was so much, it caught fire. So then you, you are floating in water and there is fire on the air, in the air. And it is, it is uh, a limitless kind of a, there's no bank to uh, where you can reach. And of course, you don't see the trees much because they're either blown away or they're underneath you. This is where a uh, forest was. And as you can see how it is, these are the photographs that I took. 
For example, this little girl has lost everyone in her family. She, she is of age five. And this is where her house was. So the idea was not to take the, the, the portraits, not to show the faces, because the, they're traumatized. So we didn't, I didn't want to go into this kind of third world photography. So they were always from the back. I was with them. So the idea is that all of us, we are with them looking at where they were. This man, for example, has lost his wife, his children, his brother, and his family, his mother, and his father. Eight persons of that family. And when, when we met him, he was really not making any sense. He was, he was not talking sense. This man, for example, was saved by his wife, because his wife was very clever. The moment the water came in, because you see the water comes in very quickly, and the moment the water started coming in, she said, take your clothes off. Because sometimes the clothes get stuck and you get strangled. That is how many times they die. So what she did was they took off their clothes, they climbed a tree, and because she had a sari, just like this, you saw the sari that my wife was wearing, she took out that sari and she wrapped herself, her husband, and their baby onto the tree, and they were saved. Now, you can imagine the force of this from this. This is all that remains of their house. Here used to be a house. And this is what is left of it. So when we see this destruction, when we see what has happened, and we, we are not aid agencies, you know, we, it's very difficult to take all this. And we, we went back. We couldn't do anything, but we thought maybe we could design something, we could make something. And the idea was to make a cyclone shelter. Now, of course, in Bangladesh, there are many cyclone shelters, at least 2,500, um, including those from the government and other NGOs, and it saves millions of lives every time there's a cyclone. But based on our own experience, on our own observations, we thought we could sort of make some changes to the existing models. And this was the first sketch. The idea was to make a kind of a cruciform-shaped building and then sort of protect it with a ramp. And the ramp, then, then immediately you would have uh, kind of light wells and ventilation wells in the four corners. And the ramp could then also protect the inner structure from high wind and hydraulic pressure. This is the plan. As I said, very simply done. During normal times, it would be used as a school and a clinic. So the upper floor is a school, three classrooms, two shifts up to class five. And on the ground floor is a clinic, which also has x-ray and other um, uh, diagnostic facilities. But the entire structure is protected by a ram. And the entire structure is of concrete. Now, why these two factors? Now, first of all, during a cyclone, there are flying debris. Everything is flying, from cows to trees to branches to tins, and it's very dangerous. So the building is protected by these, um, the ramps. And in normal standard uh, cyclone shelters, there are ordinary glasses and uh, windows, which means uh, the glasses break, and it is very difficult for people to sort of um, take in all the sound and, and, and the high wind that comes in. So our windows are again made smaller and protected uh, because they are in concrete niches. This is what happens, what would happen in a normal situation. But during the cyclone, people can gather in large numbers because the ceiling height is more. And most importantly, they can take the cattle up to the roof. This is what we learned, because during a cyclone, they don't like to leave behind their cattle, because if they, they, they may die or be lost. So, so to have some place for them on the roof, they could at least be saved from tidal waves. These are some of the renders. It was important to make it in concrete. The existing structures are brick and concrete, which don't last in the saline kind of a sea kind of weather. So this was all concrete. But we tried to make it, in terms of budget, we tried to optimize uh, the costs. 
And from the photographs we took and the stories that we had, we made a little book booklet to raise funds to make one prototype of, of this design. And we failed. We could not raise enough money um, after trying for five years. And then there was a group from Luxembourg who thought this idea was interesting. And they took one of my exhibitions to Luxembourg. This is at the foundation of Institute, uh, uh, Institute of Architects in Luxembourg. They made this exhibition, and happily, this, the cyclone shelter, of course, was on exhibit, and happily, we were able to raise funds for one project. And then, after almost uh, seven, eight years of trying, we started construction um, near the Bay of Bengal. It is under construction. It's nearly finishing now. So these are a little bit older images in the landscape. This is what it looks like somewhat. It's not finished. So this is, the, this is an actual image of the ramp sort of going up. And the ramp sort of twists as it moves up. This is in the landscape. It was important to have this as a marker, because in, 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 in rural Bangladesh, there are hardly any postcodes or um, uh, road numbers. So this is by word of mouth that people will come to know that there is a cyclone shelter there. So it was important that it be quickly becomes known as, 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 as a different kind of a building. So this is nearing completion, finally, after 11 years. The insides, inside the, one of the classrooms. Uh, the Friendship Center uh, is in the north of the country. It is a learning center for the NGO named Friendship. And um, this is the land uh, which we found. It was prone to flooding to a height of eight feet. The water would come up to here. And um, of course, to save the complex, we would need to raise it uh, above that level of floods. Uh, and this would be the general way of working, to sort of raise this. And we designed, a, an, uh, we made a design, which I showed to uh, the client, and which, was, which we were very happy with, and the client was very happy with. And when we did the cost estimates, we realized that uh, we were losing almost the entire budget just trying to raise the project. So it was costing us double the amount we had at that moment. And so we had to go back to the drawing board. And, um, and there was no way we could make this within the limited budget we had. And then I realized our building is not this. This was our building. And so this became. And we protected it through an embankment. So if flood water came, we would essentially be underwater, save for the fact that we would be protected by a mini embankment. Now, this is not the first time this has been used. We have examples of this from a, uh, of, of a, from a town called Mahastan from the third century BC, where the same kind of embankment had been used. Uh, we, don't, we have only ruins of that uh, settlement, but uh, one was inspired by that or took a clue from that to sort of try to take the challenge of making it within the limited budget that we had. With that came the attendant problem of rainwater getting collected within the areas of the, of the embankment. And we, of course, introduced a series of tanks and pools to collect the rainwater and harvest the rain. And we also introduced large uh, tanks to hold sewage because we didn't want it to contaminate the flood water. So this is what it is, two blocks. The first block is the learning area, and the second block is the residential area, both centered around community spaces. The first is a reception pavilion around which are the classrooms, are the discussion rooms, and here is a dining pavilion around which are the various dormitories and uh, residential quarters. This was very much inspired by the ruins of Buddhist monasteries in the region not far from the uh, site. You can see some of the plants here. And these are ruins from uh, about a 1,000 years old. Uh, but they're beautiful in the way they are today. 
um, with, the, with the beautiful textures and, and you can see the plan of it but you don't see uh, much else but it gives you that feeling you know th this is a monk's cell for example a small cell um, where a monk as you know would me meditate for days on end perhaps uh, w even without water and food and this inspired us to sort of think about this space this learning center as a kind of a meditative space and we sort of sought to transform this into this and then of course uh, we could connect it to the greater um, surrounding landscape the the entire complex is in a rural agricultural area and it was very important to sort of relate to that as well but the thermal mass which is the the earth on the ceiling help uh, on the roof helps to lower the temperature in the insides and therefore we can obviate the need for uh, air conditioning uh, even during hot summer months. So the broken forms of this pavilion kind of forms helps to sort of encourage um, natural uh, ventilation, cross ventilation, and the introduction of these pools also helps in microclimatic cooling. All the material are local, so the bricks that you see are from just one kilometer away. Um, the bricks were not of very good quality, but we set up a kind of a system to sort of uh, sort the bricks out. So the, it was three sortings. First was sorted at site, then it was sorted when it was put on the truck, and then it was sorted when it was brought down from the truck, and then it was sorted again when it was actually used by the masons. So one predominant material, bricks for the structure, bricks for the floor. One of the reasons is here we would have various types of people coming from donor agencies, from EU um, uh, and, the, and the West, to people from the river areas, sometimes who don't even have shoes. So it was important to balance that, where everybody could come, all from all walks of life. And this is um, one of the pools, one of the courtyards with the pools. The photographs are by Hélène Binet, whom I think is, is one of the most wonderful photographers in the world. The uh, dining pavilion. This is local mahogany wood, one of the dorm rooms, the male dorm areas. So sometimes the, the ladies or the people who would come for training, for example, expecting mothers would come for training for hygiene and sanitation, and they would sit on the ground like this and discuss. So we had so little budget for this project. Uh, we could, I, I say all we could give them is uh, the luxury of light and shadows. So it was a kind of a weave of these pavilions and pools and gardens and, and very, very um, simple materials. And we, which, through which we hoped that lives of people would be um, better. This is the last project I will show you. It's an it's a art park, art center and park by um, uh, the foundation which hosts the Dhaka Art Summit. You might know this has become a very important summit in the art calendar. Uh, it takes place every two years. Um, and, uh, in the region, it has become very, very important. And they are, have initiated this project. This is under construction. Uh, it is in the northeast of the country in, um, in an area called Silet. It is close to India, it is all around is India, and here is our project. It is um, kind of an undulating terrain, uh, very wet. The wettest place on earth is very close to here, so a lot of rain and very green. And uh, also there are very beautiful estuaries and wetlands all around. So this is the site. Um, 
we enter through here, and as you can see, all of it is paddy fields and um, almost forest-like um, trees and, and uh, growth. Uh, we chose three areas. We, instead of having one large building, we separated them. This is phase one. There would be more things coming up, but this is a sculpture park. So uh, we thought it is interesting to break up the, the various functions so that people would sort of walk from one area to the other and enjoy the, the various artworks uh, sort of on display in the landscape. So this would be the first structure as one comes in. This is an art gallery or kind of a gallery. And this is the artist's uh, residence. This would be a residency program where artists would come and live. So the, the entry structure is really a space trap. So space does not flow directly in or out. So there's a kind of a trap which sort of one comes in, gets dropped off, and then walks inside or uses a small kind of a buggy uh, to sort of go in. Um, local handmade bricks. So from the entry structure, one sort of goes inside into the inner landscape and then into um, an area where the artist's residence would be. We chose a small hillock for the um, artist's houses. Uh, one part was very much uh, wooded with a lot of thick um, uh, bamboo uh, sort of overgrowth, and the other area was open. So this is the area we chose for uh, the houses themselves, and in it we inserted uh, the dining pavilion. And we made the houses individual, and sort of we played around to uh, see how we could place them in the landscape, to sort of see how it sets into the topography, and also uh, sort of connect to the various views. And uh, we came up with something like this, and. Um, then on to this, because for me, this, these views out, these curated kind of views out were very important. And this is the, uh, the final uh, kind of layout. The, the houses here, the dining pavilion here, another house here. And very simple, um, again, almost monastic. Uh, this is built of concrete cast in wood. It take, the concrete takes the color of the earth. The, 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 the earth here is reddish yellow. It takes the color of the earth and um, we use a grayish green stone sort of which merges with the, the rest of the, the green. Various houses of the artists. as I said, some views out onto the landscape where the various uh, sculptures and installations will be. For the last structure, the, 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 the gallery, the curator said we needed a black box. You know how it is today. They want a black box or a white cube uh, where they can sort of uh, make things on their own. And this was the dimension sort of they wanted and said, don't worry about this, we'll make it. You don't have to do anything about it. And of course, I realized this is going to be a disaster. So the moment the meeting ended, I drew this. I said, we have to do something about it. And this quickly, in a few hours, became this. And, um, and then, of course, this is what we are making. Uh, it's under construction. All this is to be finished before the end of this year. Um, and it's set in the paddy field. Uh, agriculture continues. Made of local handmade bricks. And the space in between the curved walls and the main black box, so to speak, we are using those spaces for the various installations and uh, artworks. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, for Professor Kashev Chowdhury, for telling your views and experiences. It's very inspiring presentations. And next, we are going to have a Q&A. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. We will bring you a microphone. In English or Thai? Yes. Yeah. Anyone? Yes? Please. Hi. Uh, thank, thank you for your presentation. It's really, really beautiful. Uh, I just have a question actually about this last uh, project. The, the pigment in the, in, the, in, the, in the concrete, is that from the earth or is that a coloured pigment that you put in just to to match the earth color? It's, it's, it's both. We put in a little earth, but the amount of earth needed was not sort of um, we losing the strength of the concrete. So then we had to put in a pigment, yes. But the idea was to sort of relate to the ground as it went up. Hi, um, thank you for your nice presentation. I um, would like to know, like, uh, as a pro um, photographer and, an, and uh, as an architect, how does it support each other? Um, I, I, well, it's, photography is taking the three dimension into the two dimension. Architecture is just op opposite. We draw in two dimensions and make three dimensional things. But other than that, it was, I was a photographer before I became an architect. It's, it's, it just happened that way. I, I used to work as a professional photographer as well. But photography for me was, uh, was nice because it helped me to go close to the people because I was doing a quite a lot of uh, documentary photography. So I went into the villages, into the streets, every week, twice, two days a week, every, every weekend I was out there, you know, with my photographer friends. We were walking into the villages and that made us very, you know, that made me go very close to the people. So sort of even going to people's homes and having meals with them. And this is something I think is missing many times for architects. We are, as architects, we are many times in our studios. We, 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 of course, we do a lot of research and studies, but much of the field work is done by uh, our associates, which uh, in a way is a shame in the sense, um, if you look at photographers, photographers don't have any associates. Even if you're a very famous photographer, uh, like Robert Frank or somebody, you still go out and take those photographs. You know, you have to be there on, on site, so to speak. And that is the beauty about photography, um, that you are there and, um, and, and not so much in your studio uh, as, as such. So I think uh, that taught me a, a, a great lesson in the sense um, we architects, I think we need to be, um, yes, find some excuse to be there and um, sort of um, on, on a regular basis and not sort of lose physical touch with for whom we build. Hi, um, I'm just very curious about the, um, the black hole in the memorial. Um, about the translation of the design, I wonder how you come about it. Um, uh, as, as I said, you know, it's 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 not really well known, but uh, the war for the independence of Bangladesh is one of the most painful chapters in the history, in human history, in especially in recent human history, and um, that was the only way, sort of, uh, we could express the pain. 
because you see it, it it is not just the people who fought you know armies fight with each other you know they are armed both are armed they fight with each other but when an army sort of descends upon uh, and uh, and uh, and on a people unaware of what is happening and and when it, when they uh, systematically um, sort of engage themselves um, into genocide and rape, mass rape, uh, things are really very, very different. And these people, are they, they were not able to say anything because at that time, just imagine that in the country there's this full-fledged army sort of stationed. And within that kind of a scenario, ordinary people People were trained with wooden guns, if you believe it. They were trained with toy guns. Um, so uh, it's it's uh, so we wanted to express that the the silent bearing of that torture and genocide. I mean, how how do you protest? You can protest to some other country. You, we we did. We protested to our neighboring country, which is India. We protested worldwide in London, and you know there was this famous concert for Bangladesh, and all of these things happened. But in the country itself, you could not protest to anybody because the, the government is against you, the army is against you. So, uh, so that was very important for us to show that the, the silent bearing of that, of that unknown, undocumented torture, that was, uh, yes, that was important. Thanks for your uh, very inspiring presentation. Uh, I'm really interested in the how you, as an architect, to be engaged with the social, like you you told others that when the, they have the cyclone, you feel you can stay comfortable in your studio anymore. You have to go outside. So I feel it's very, very give us the the courage to to go outside to to response to the social too. Uh, I have some question that uh, I, I really is interesting that the, the project of the, the Cyclone Center, uh, I, I want to know that if this have complete, what the people, the, the villagers think about them or is it uh, work for the, 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 the solving the problem? And, and another project is the, the rest settlement. I, I wonder that when they have the, the dry season, how the people on the rest elevated settlement live, or how they go outside the community, and what the, the villagers think about the project. But I, I think it's very natural that you, you, you prepare the landscape and you let them grow naturally. But uh, have you ever? go back to, to ask the community what they think about it. I have these questions. So I guess there are a number of questions there. Um, first of all, uh, for the plinth raising, um, it's not very high. It's just eight feet high. So one can easily just walk down to the surrounding areas where they have their paddy fields and their agricultural fields. And uh, yes, uh, we do frequently go back and see whether it's happening. We built, between 2005 and 2012, we built about 12 of these plants. And um, five, I think, broke away. It just vanished because of the, the force of the water. It, it, it didn't last. I think seven are there. And of them, I think two are, again, uh, in not in very good condition. So we go back, yes. One of the things, uh, you know, you learn a lot from these experiences. One of the persons who is a village headman over there, he's, he said something very profound. He said, every day you b go back home and you never think whether your home is there or not. Every day I go back, when I go back from my work, from my field agriculture, I think whether I will go back to see my house there or not. So that's a very different kind of a life. And I think those, well, when, when we say uh, architecture is static, it is rooted, 
but still, you know, it makes you think, you know, and it also, of course, makes you think about life and other things, you know. So, um, yes, th those projects, um, I, I, I guess, uh, for an architect, um, you see, we architects, we are social workers. This is how I see it. Um, this is how it has to be, especially in this age and, and time. Um, we, we cannot be slave to corporate, um, you know, imagery or, you know, advertisement or whatever it is. Somebody was saying for corporate identity, advertisement and architecture, these are the two strongest things. We cannot only do that. We cannot only build for um, rich people's houses or that sort of thing. I'm, I'm not saying there's wrong in it. You know, there's, 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 architecture is very, you know, it's be, very big. But definitely, we are social workers, for sure. And as social workers, we need to be out there, out there in the society, not just, you know, not just clubbing or not just enjoying ourselves, but really trying to understand the people for whom we build, from, to whom we serve. And uh, that, that sometimes, I think, uh, gets uh, lost in translation. Uh, that does happen, I think. And, to, and, and in this world, uh, I think the last 20 years have taught us that we don't need this very, very expensive, iconic, landmark projects. Projects we don't really need, but projects, I mean, it, it's what they call the Bilbao effect, you know. Bilbao worked very well for Bilbao, uh, the, the, the Guggenheim. It really worked very well. And it started a whole lot of these projects. and. Personally, I'm very critical of some of these. They spent hundreds of millions, and now nowadays it's a everything is a billion dollars. You know, the the, the Louis Vuitton project in France is a billion dollars, and whether we need to spend that billion dollars to just bend glass and make that thing, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, in this same world where a few thousand miles away, people are without shelter for, God knows, for months or years. Even in Bangladesh at the moment, we are facing this huge refugee, I shouldn't say crisis, but I should say um, a, 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 a kind of a, an event. And um, so we, we do not have enough funds for anything. We do not have surplus funds. We are just kidding ourselves by saying, we have enough money to make uh, iconic projects, branding our cities or our, you know, whatever it is. But we never have enough uh, uh, funds to cater uh, because it's a global community. When we talk about identity, when we talk about um, architecture, we like to talk about this globalness. When we talk about culture, we like to talk about this global culture, this global coming together and all of these things. But when we talk about uh, the real needs of society, we, I think we miss the point sometimes. We sometimes don't think of the global need of, of the society, you know? So, um, and, and we, many times, we cannot be fanciful. That is the other problem. So the cyclone shelter, for example, is, is, is a design. You might think it's a fanciful design, but it is not a fanciful design. It's a basic design. We have tried to put in as much creative effort in it as possible so that it becomes known to the people. It becomes very quickly known to the people. And we are try all we are trying to do is make a prototype. And then after we have done this, we will formally give it to the government, the constant ministry. We will give it to them. We'll give all the drawings f for free, of course. And many of the projects that I showed today is done pro bono. We don't have fees for them. Um, I'm not saying that everybody has to do that. I'm just saying that we all uh, can give back to the, to the... I studied in a university w almost for free. It's a public university. It's, uh, uh, you know, almost for free. And so how, how do I give back? I, I guess that's, that's one of the very few ways uh, sort of we can give back uh, to uh, society needing our input other than just some fanciful um, personal kind of, uh, sometimes even whimsical kind of design ideas. Uh, that I find troubling. In this world, 
I think that's a little bit troubling. I think inve investigation and, and a thorough knowledge and research and a real commitment can really result in meaningful architecture, architecture that people really need, architecture that people can really use. I mean, it doesn't, a shopping center can be a very meaningful architecture, for, for sure. I mean, it's not just, it doesn't have to be all cyclone shelters all around. I mean, it could be, you know, any form of a hospital or, or a shopping center or a, or a public space or anything. Everything can have a lot of meaning to, to, to its citizens so long as we have done our research and so long as we have optimized our resources, never forgetting that we, have, we do not have excess resources at hand. Even if we are from a rich country or we have a big budget for it. So uh, yes, we are social workers. We are, as architects, we are ordinary people trying to do extraordinary or non-ordinary things. So, um, hi, um, I'm the landscape architect, and actually I have a, a few questions to, to ask you. And first of all, I would like to, to thank for the impressive uh, presentation, which you have um, remind me and remind us of the, the power of the architect, the ability in, in becoming the, the social worker in helping the, the people. But uh, I'm just wondering how we can bridge this kind of gap, because how we can make this kind of profession to be like a necessity um, profession to the real challenge of the, the society, not the option. Because I think this kind of the project is that uh, it is very critical to, to, to have the profession as an architect to, to contribute and to, to play an important role. But I think um, in your country and also in my country, we might say, we might share the same kind of the, the problems where we are not in the, the, the conversation in, in helping this kind of the challenge that uh, territory is facing. This is number the number one um, question that um, we would like to see how it's going to, to make the difference in the future. Because I think you have mentioned that there are so many challenges that uh, we are facing in terms of the climate change, right? And the second question is that, uh, what made you choose your approach in the design language to become more landscape, not uh, architecture to me? When I look at your work, it's, it's more like a landscape kind of the, um, language in, in, try, in trying to, to fit in to, to, to the mother nature, not to, to impose or to be present, what what make your 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 choosing that kind of language? Yeah, I have two questions. Thank you. Um, I think we must we must agree that nature does not need architecture. We need architecture. Nature does not want anything on itself. You see, if, uh, we build houses, we build buildings, because we need shelters, we need functions, but nature does not need it. We always, the first act of building is an intrusion. The first act of building is an imposition, for sure. This is a given. We must agree to it. We can only lessen that effect by, by building sympathetically, by being very sensitive about that context, the natural context, the human context. But today, na our nature has become more and more fragile all around the world. So that, that becomes even more complicated, which means we need to be very, very careful how and where we tread. And it's, it's, it, it cannot be a kind of, um, there's no mantra for it. There's no formula for it. I think it's all about um, 
all about deep concentration and deep faith and deep realization. Because we are natural beings. Human beings have been natural beings for 50, 70,000 years. And now for the last 10,000 years, we have started building our civilizations and we have plundered the earth. We have mined it, we have cut it, we have cut its trees, whatever we have done. But it, it, this, is, this is not poetry I'm talking about. This is, this, is not, this is not something to talk about. This is real. Today, it is real. In Bangladesh, is a hotbed. If you want to see uh, climate change, you can see it today. I mean, it, it's, it's not a story anymore. I live in a, I showed my apartment. I tell you, I started living there in 2002. I did not need a ceiling fan. There was no fan. It was naturally ventilated, no problem. 2000, since 2008, it is impossible to live there without some form of a cooling. And we ended up putting a small air conditioning unit in one of the side places. It was unbearable. The same place. I'm witness to it. 2002 to 2008, six years, no problem. After 2008, impossible. So it is changing at a fast rate. So our responsibility as an architect, I think, should go much beyond what is generally discussed. I mean, look at us. We are discussing here, maybe 70 of us. It's not enough. It needs to be out there, you know. It needs to be... This kind of awareness is not about architects. It's about everybody. Yes, people build buildings. Without buildings, nothing happens. You know, we build warehouses, hospitals, houses, whatever. We build buildings. Man makes buildings. But that, we have to incorporate that, that consciousness again into that act of building. About the landscape, again, the same thing. I think it is not about um, the landscape around the building. It is about the building in the landscape. So the landscape was always there. How much we put in there, what we put in there, how we put in there, when we put in there, all these questions. If we can answer them, maybe we can make better buildings. Uh, but for sure, the, the, the nature does not want buildings on itself, for sure. They don't want it. Oh, it. It's we who want it. We think by making a building, making a resort, we can make that place better. It's not possible. So uh, it's also not to say we should hide our buildings. It is a fact. We should take it as a fact, but then get into the real aspects of sustainability. Now again, what is sustainability? Common sense. We were sustainable. All of our cultures, you know, in Thailand, in Bangladesh, totally sustainable. Go back 50 years, it was only natural fertilizers. Totally f sustainable. Today, we need to have experts to talk about sustainability. So we know what sustainability is within us. It's common sense. We know what is good for the environment, what is bad for the environment. We know cutting down a tree is not good. We know it. We don't have to discuss it. So it's all common sense. I mean, we can make buildings sustainable by spending a lot of money. But what about the economics of sustainability? Money is also a part of sustainability. Making buildings last is a sustainability. We have to make our buildings last. That's part of the sustainability. Because you invest something, if it lasts 10 years, that's one thing. If it lasts 100 years, that's another thing. So you get a lot of return from it. So all those little things, I mean, we can talk about embedded energy and all this sort of thing, but what about the other, other things? So I think it's all about the common sense. It's all about the common sense. And the landscape, for sure, we are foreigners to this landscape. We must treat ourselves as foreigners visiting these landscapes. And unless we really understand it, we will remain foreigners. Thank you very much.
Thanks for the fantastic presentation. I have one question. Um, what are the distinctive points of tropical architecture in Bangladesh? Because I saw from your presentation, it's not concerned about uh, the building, but you have to concern about the natural disaster that frequently happen in Thailand. Um, I think Thailand and Bangladesh, as you might know, share a, quite a lot of common uh, things in terms of uh, natural sort of phenomenon and natural conditions. The, your soil condition is very similar to our soil, soil condition. You know, it's it's uh, uh, it's not very high load bearing. It's um, and then you have rain, a lot of rain, and you have heat. Uh, it's very similar in many ways. Um, but as as I was just saying. It is as as this is designed. You know, it's uh, this is the way to go forward, to make sure that we maximize naturally ventilated, low energy consumption areas. We maximize that. We cannot make it 100 percent. It's not possible. If this was no, not not air conditioned, you would not be able to hear me speak. So this is essential to. It's necessary to air condition this. So. Any non-essential spaces should be not air conditioned. So, for example, the worst examples are the office buildings, the office towers with the you know which are glass chimneys. You keep on heating them, and then you keep on cooling them using a lot of energy. So those are wrong for sure. The the shopping center atriums, large atriums full of centrally air conditioned spaces. You continuously pump in air condition uh, cool air, and you try to make it cool. And that's, that for sure has to be wrong. So things like that, you know, uh, in the tropics, there's no such thing as tropical architecture. For, I, I don't believe it. There's no, this is, this is architecture. This is architecture, yes, we, in the tropics. So, um, uh, so it's, it's, it's how people have lived. Again, look at the vernacular, look at the way people have lived for thousands of years, a house, a courtyard, and something in the front something at the back. So, for example, in, in, in our country, we say you have, a, uh, you have a house, and then you have a pond, and you have a courtyard, and then you have a shade, that sort of thing. So, um, so that kind of, I'm not saying you need to have a pond. You can have a reflecting pool. You can turn that into a lake, for example. So all of that, I think, is very similar. So living in the tropics is all about the linen shirt, for example, so living comfortably. And, um, and I think uh, we, we, we don't need to follow Western models. We don't need to, I showed you Caspar David Friedrich's uh, uh, image of, of that pale winter morning. We don't need that because we are not in Norway, for example, and we don't need to use um, glass in that way. We don't need to uh, totally insulate our buildings. We don't need to make tight buildings. We need to make porous buildings, and uh, the more even even office buildings, even office buildings. Uh, Charles Correa has a very interesting. This this is I don't know if it's uh, very well known, but he has a very interesting shopping mall in Calcutta, where a long time ago in the 1980s he he designed this. Only the shops are air conditioned, so the intermediate spaces are all naturally ventilated. A brilliant idea, but you know what? Nobody picked up on it. There was no reputation of that. Very strange. Nobody copied that. Nobody took that idea. Nobody said, oh, wow, what a brilliant idea. Nobody did that. The same goes for his uh, Kanchanjunga apartments in Bombay. So when we talk about architects, we, we, I think we, we, we are in some ways unfortunate. I heard Charles Correa say that he built the Kanchanjunga apartments in, in Bombay, which is a wonderful piece of architecture both visually and climatically. It works fantastically in terms of uh, cross ventilation. And after he built that in 19, I think he finished it in 1981 or something. After that, he did not get a single commission in the city of Bombay. He lived and worked in Bombay. He did not get another building commission in Bombay. Can you believe it? So this is where architects are. And Charles Correa is a famous architect in India. He was always famous. So th there's something wrong. People don't understand architecture. People really don't. And 
I think now today there are many award systems, many uh, organizations who are promoting these ideas through films and books. Asham Sip is one of them, uh, we, I understood. And this, this is very important to sort of make people understand how our living environment, how our built environment and our built heritage can be better through just a better design. And, and that is, I guess, the only way forward. Any questions? Okay, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, I don't have a question, but I'd like to, you know, just make my presence known. I want to thank Asom Silk, especially the chairman, for inviting me to this wonderful lecture. I would have, wouldn't have missed it. <laughs> and I want to congratulate uh, Kasha for being here. It's a great privilege to listen to you. And uh, you know, I'm the ambassador of Bangladesh in Thailand, trying to build bridges of friendship and cooperation between the two countries. And you just did it so wonderfully with the Thai architectures a whole uh, room full of people here who are devotees to architecture. Um, Kasif, I just noticed from your Wikipedia CV that you studied civil engineering. No, my father was civil engineering. Oh, your father was civil so, Well, there's only one thing we have in common with Kasif, me and Kasif. We uh, graduated from the same university, <laughs> Bangladesh <laughs> University of Engineering Technology. Um, you know, it, it pains me to know that you're, you know, you have contributed so much in creating what we can, if you may, call social architecture, but and sustainable architecture. But isn't there a network of architects all over the world doing that in the age of sustainable development goals, where you just mentioned there's just no extra resources, there's no extra money when so much money is being spent and wasted. So. What is your opinion? How can we help, especially from the governments, from the international organizations? Uh, because I know that when we make a building, one of the sustainable development goals, perhaps goal 15, is building sustainable cities. And how does the architectural community fit into there? I mean, in, you, someone said we need to have a voice. So how does the voice integrate into the sustainable development architecture? Could you recommend something that you know we can recommend to our government and perhaps the Bangladesh government and Thailand can work together towards that end? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, no, it's, it, it, yes, it just appears that there is really no such network. I think you are right. There is no such network. I'm not aware of any network where you know, uh, COP21 and all those seminars, they, they hardly invite architects. I'm not aware of any architect being invited to such uh, uh, forums on, on climate change or, or environmental strategies. Um, I think uh, this is a very big point, actually. We should, we should all think about this because um, uh, buildings are... Uh, one of the major uh, sort of components which are generating, um, you know, um, heat and, and uh, you know, is, is responsible for energy consumption and all those things. And But I don't, I really don't think there is, well, there are some, there are some uh, small groups, peer, uh, some kind of uh, peer groups, but for sure, they're not invited to the, the major forums. That, that it's true, and, and I'm a little bit shocked to sort of think about this. It's true, we are not invited. I mean, I've been invited to, um, to forums on, on environmental uh, impact and change, but mainly centering on architects. So the, the audience were, were architects, and the speakers were architects, but not in general forums, no. I think that is that is one thing we should all think about. Maybe there should be general forums where architects are talking more and more about um, about climate change and how simple 
methods of building. I mean, we don't need always to think about a certain material, a certain strategy, but various strategies of how uh, we can make, um, you know, uh, a more assured future for ourselves. Yes. Thank you.